So that's people in finance sort of blowing themselves up. But what about people who aren't actually being as, as, as nefarious as these people? What are people who are like working in general in finance? Some of you may have heard of the Black Scholes equation. It was developed in the early 70s. It's a way to price options. So an option is a contract where I say to you, I promise to buy this many shares from you at this price in six months' time. <laughs> or I might want to buy shares from you at this price in six months' time, depending on the type of option or sell or vice versa. So it's, so it's and that, yeah, so in this case, the option I'm describing is one where you, have, you might want to buy the shares at some fixed price later on. These contracts are hard to, to, to price. Because I know what, what, what the price of the shares are today. I look at the market and I see what, what price they're going for. How do I price? What's the value of the contract which says, if I want to, I can buy 100 shares off you in two weeks' time at this price? What's the value of this contract? It was unclear how to price these things. Black and Scholes came up with a way to price options. Revolution of the financial market. Because if you can price something, you can trade it. If you can't agree on a price, you can't trade it. So this is a way for people to price and agree on a price of options. This equation has seven assumptions, I think four of which are fairly mathematical. You know, we, we assume continuity, whereas in reality time is little discrete one second steps. So this sort of stuff, like, okay, yeah. And then it has other assumptions which I just Assumptions, like constant volatility. Just assume that the market has constant volatility. You can assume that, sure. But it doesn't work. It's not a mathematical simplification. It's a genuine assumption on how the world works. And from that you have a model and then you can draw an equation. This was used to fuel automated trading in the late 80s because even the derivation of Blackshaw's equation is somewhat tricky, use the heat equation. The actual use of Black Scholes is really easy. It's a formula with about five variables. Now someone in late high school could put the variables into the formula and compute the price. So people started writing little computer programs in the 80s to do away trading, in great part based on this for, for, for shares and options, for, for options pricing. But this, the, this pricing system wasn't foolproof. And the market found itself in a position where the volatility was no longer constant, and the equation broke down. And, it, and it, this was in part what fueled the crash of 87. Which I think most of you were negative 10 years old when that happened. <laughs> yeah, most. So once upon a time, there was 1987, and, and, and there was a fairly chunky <coughs> stock market crash. Not as big as what happened in that 2007, but still quite substantial. And that was driven in part by the misunderstanding and misuse and the ease of use of an equation like this. I said, someone in my high school could, could, could implement it. Derivation, a bit more tricky. Diffusion equation, heat equation, sorry. So afterwards, they decided to fix the black Scholes equation by adding extra sort of correction terms on, on the side. And now you've got this sort of Frankenstein Black Scholes equation that people are trying to use. So, so, so this sort of they try and run this people in finance are trying to use an equation like this. It might fail, sometimes catastrophically, and then say, oh sorry about that. Maybe we should add an extra term. That's kind of so now it looks like basically it literally is a Frankenstein equation. It's got a nice, it's a, it's a really nice sort of start, I can't remember. It's so, you know. I, you know, alpha, so I can't remember what it is. Uh, theta, a, something. Really sort of lovely start. And then there's the correction terms. And these things are like there's some square roots going on here, and the other stuff I can't remember what they're on the head, but it really is like, well, they're going to like try and beat this thing into a box to make it work again. So it's sort of beautiful mathematics here and then stuff stays along to the side to make it actually work a bit better. Many were blinded by the elegance at the start, and they realized that the world is not a terribly elegant place, even though we feel like mathematics is. <laughs> the important point here was that 
The limitations of this are fairly clear if you understood the derivation. But the people using it did not understand the derivation, for the most part. In fact, Black and Scholes themselves were one mathematician, one economist. Two professions coming together to, to make this, this, this model. If you don't know the derivation of something, you can't properly understand its limitations. I can give you some warnings at the end, but that's not the same as I really understand the limitations of, of, of the model and the equation. This is why we try and teach you proofs and not just give you theorems. Mm. Theorem is still true, but now you have some understanding of what a theorem is true and the limitations therein. This also applies to using things in industry. Know what you're using and where it comes from. GFC 2007. Oh, this is a doozy. This is this is this is a comedy of errors. Were it not for the fact that people's livelihoods were destroyed. So someone decided that that that, that we should try and see what we can do in the financial market with crappy mortgages, called subprime mortgages. So mortgages where people, the, 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 the person who, who took out a loan, maybe it's not a big mortgage, or people with sort of low-ish income, mortgages where you think about these mortgages have a higher than usual rate of default. And so you've got a big pile of them, what do you do with them? They're crappy mortgages. Well, they created these structures called collateralized debt obligations, which is basically the following. You take your big pile of mortgages, put them in a bucket, and then you're going to sort of split this up into what are called tranches. And I call this sort of tranche one up to whatever it is, tranche five, say. <laughs> So, every time somebody makes a mortgage repayment, the owners of tranche one get paid first. The owners of tranche two get paid second. So, people make mortgage repayments, and other people make enough mortgage repayments that the tranche one was paid out first. So, then we start paying out tranche two, tranche three, tranche four, tranche five. So, the idea is that well, we've got all these mortgages, tranche one constitutes the top sort of 20% slice. So as long as 20% of people pay back their mortgage every month, tranche one gets paid out in full. What does that mean? Tranche one's great. I mean, come on, the 20% must be paying back the mortgage, right? So tranche one is, yay. Of course, tranche five is a giant stinking pile of shit. Because these are crappy mortgages, and you know that there's some schmuck who isn't paying his mortgage. So these are crappy, these are really crappy. But what have you done? You've taken crappy mortgages and made something good. I mean, these top three tranches were considered to be fairly good, actually. So it rings on sun. These top three tranches were considered to be good. Good, sound financial investments built on a pile of shit. So what happened? Well, the pricing model for this was a particular model. So there are ways to, so you've got this, this, this the, all the different distributions here of, of, of what might happen to each mortgage. Can I just ask a quick question, because I'm not quite understanding the mechanism of this repayment of the tranches. <laughs> okay, so, all, so, <laughs> all mortgage repayments from every tranche first go to pay off tranche one. That's correct and not pay off at all any of the others. Until tranche one is fully paid. And then you move down. And then the tranche one. <coughs> okay, thanks. So you're pulling the repayments. Yeah. No, 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 so it's not to say that, so you, so, so the person in tranche one kind of owns a bit of all the mortgages, yeah. but not. You're not actually, you're not, saying, no, you're not saying, I think these are the best mortgages, I think these are the worst mortgages. 
The mortgages go this way, sort of thing. If that makes any sense. So does this mean that, for instance, someone who has a mortgage in tranche three and inquires about... No, no, mortgages don't exist in a particular tranche. No mortgage lives inside one tranche. You take an entire pot of mortgages and say, okay, the first 20% of repayments goes to the people who bought tranche one. The next 20% of repayments go to the people who bought tranche two. But then, <coughs> if they bought... Ah, so the mortgage is... The mortgage is removed into a legal entity called this blob. <laughs> <laughs> you can speak to lawyers, I think this is about the level of sophistication, but this blob, this blob dot ink limited, whatever it is. So it's the mortgages themselves that have been sold off? Yes, the mortgage has been sold on into this legal blob, and then you come and buy a tranche of this legal blob. And the, tra and, and the tranche that you buy, I mean... And you, 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 can, you, you can buy shares in a tranche, but it doesn't really matter. Just say you buy like, the whole tranche. The tranche you buy determines when you get paid when mortgage payments come back. Okay, so this is great. Now, you've got all these mortgages in here. Each one has a chance of default and stuff like this. What's the chance of default of, say, tranche two? All those little pieces in there. So you want to try and get a single distribution, or a small number of distributions, for the chance of default of these five tra tranches, based on the, the, the zillion of, of mortgages that go into this whole legal entity. <laughs> so there's a way to do that, and it's called a copula function, which I'm not going to detail here. Now there's a theorem that says that you always have a copula function, basically a way to turn Many distributions one distribution. But the theorem doesn't guarantee uniqueness. So there are many ways you can do this. What's the nicest way to sort of look at a distribution that we always keep seeing? Gaussian. We like Gaussians. Gaussians are cool. We understand them. So everyone started using what's called the Gaussian copula, which is one of many options you could have, one of many choices you could have taken. Now, the main thing this was nice. We could do an out, like, proper analysis on it. We could solve equations. This is great. But it had certain drawbacks. One was it didn't factor in tail dependence. So tail dependence says if you have two low probability events, then the chance of there being correlation between them is extremely low. So in other words, low probability event is house defaulting. So two houses next door to each other on the same street, each has a low chance of defaulting, therefore there is a low chance, there is an ultra low correlation between the two. Of course that's rubbish. There's two houses on the same street, they're going to be heavily influenced by economic factors in that particular area. So this didn't take that into account. There was one so, anyway, let me, I want to finish out how these things were, were, were priced. So, the kicker here is that you've got these mortgages. And they have some value B, some all the values of the mortgages. Okay, what's the value of this whole thing with the tranches drawn on? The sum of the values of the tranche, call this V2, is greater than V1. I've created something from nothing. The, value, the sum of the values of the mortgages is V1. The sum of the values of the tranches is V2. V2 is bigger than V1. What have I changed about the actual product here? What have I done in the physical world to change what the product is? Nothing. Same underlying physical product. So basically, I've taken a, a, a pile of shit and I've like redistributed it in such a way that, 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 this, that this top fifth is now served to you for dinner. And you think, hmm, yum. No, I've still got the same underlying shit, which people didn't quite understand. 
how do I decide where to draw the tranches? Where to actually, you know, I've sort of said, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but they could be 7, they could be 10, and they might not go 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 
Now that's fine. They do that with derivatives all the time if they know how to value them. The problem is when CDOs go south, you then don't know the value of your CDO squared. And CDO cubed. And therefore CDO cubed. And, and what the, the, the market crash occurs, as it were, because CDOs have gone tits up, you who placed a whole bunch of bets on CDO squared have no idea of the value of those bets. And suddenly, because you can't value it, it has no value. It's gone. And Pierce speaks truth here. Value just went. How much value from 2007, 2009? The write down was $625 billion off the CDO market. That's $625 billion that went poof. That's $100 for every leading person at the time, roughly. What's the budget of the UK? The, UK the, the US defense budget at the time was $450 billion. <laughs> So, yeah, your, your perspective of numbers may have changed slightly now. This is a serious amount of money. Everyone blinks when you lose this much money. There isn't an entity on the face of the earth that wouldn't go, yikes. Not one. So at the time, the US military budget per annum was $450 billion. So, this is almost the same as what the US spends on, spent on military in those two years, getting close to those numbers. And that money, it didn't go to someone else. The value, the received value just went Because we built abstraction, 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 abstraction. When you say people, do you mean originally assumed. And so the, the, the value just went and also you had and also you had this sort of feedback loop that okay, some people start defaulting. This delicate system starts to sort of crumble apart. Values go down, write downs, what happens? The economy starts slowing down. People aren't trading as much. People start losing their job couple of us are losing their jobs, or they're buying fewer shoes or Ferraris or whatever, or t-shirts. So what happens? If you want people to lose their jobs, if you want people to follow their mortgages, more default, more ripple effect. So in a very short period of time, um, who here who here was born before '95? Few. So some of you might remember that like there was a sort of 12-month window where the whole that was born before '95, so, where, where the whole world went from everything's great and fine to what the. And that was exactly this happening. It was about a 12-ish month turnaround where it really went crunch. I remember the, 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 the peak it was early in 2007. That's when, that, that, that was the point at which like everything topped out. And then it started a gradual decline, and then in September, October 2008, it went clunk. But the realization started in late 07. I was here in part three. I went to take some money out of the bank. I'm like, why is Australian dollar gone down fifteen percent? Because the market started to realise, hang on a minute, things aren't so good, and then it, the ripple effect took a while to, to probably go through. <laughs> who's doing this? Who's pricing this? Who was arranging all of this? Mathematicians in finance. Mathematicians in finance. You come here for the careers fair in about a week or two. And there are two rooms. There's one room for mathematical finance, and there's another room for all other careers. And guess which room is busier? Finance one. You can't move in that room. <coughs> we feed the people who do this. We send them. Mathematicians go and are doing this work. This is mathematicians' work. These copulas derived by mathematicians. 
Understanding Gaussians. It's our work. Who understands Gaussians? Our historians? No. Botanists? Probably not. Often do. Sorry? They often do, botanists. Gaussians? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll tell you so. It's us. It's us who understands this, it's us who does this. Now, had we been a little bit paper predecessors, been a little bit more responsible and thought, can you really just take a pile of stuff and draw some lines and make it worth more? Because that's all that was done for this. And what's, what are the effects of that going to be? If it's really that easy, what are the actual ripple effects? What are the forward, what's the forward propagation going to be? And I'll look, I can abstract, unabstract, unabstract. Hang on, I can't just keep generating money indefinitely in the finite world. Something's got to give. Something did give. 625 billion things gave. Ouch. 